This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. The legal information presented on In Legal Terms is meant to provide general information about the topics discussed and is not necessarily the opinion of Mississippi Public Broadcasting. The information conveyed does not create any type of attorney-client relationship. Please consult an attorney provider before making any decisions about your specific legal questions. Welcome to In Legal Terms from MPB Think Radio, the show all about you and your rights. Our host is Professor Richard Gershon of the University of Mississippi School of Law. I'm Liz Gill. Hello, Professor Gershon. How are you today? Doing great, Liz. Good morning. I hope you're doing well and had a good weekend and a good start to your week. Uh, and today we're excited to welcome attorney Susan Steffi to the show to talk about mediation. Uh, we had Professor Debbie Bell on the show several times, and uh, in talking with her about uh, mediation, she said, we have to get Susan Steffi on the show. So we're really excited to have Susan on the show today. And good morning, Ms. Steffi. Would, would you please tell us about your background and how you became interested in mediation? Sure. Uh, good morning. I, I'm a practicing lawyer in Mississippi. I've been here since 1991. I uh, am also a member of the Florida Bar, where I practiced for a few years before I moved to Mississippi. And over the years, doing a very diverse practice, I had experience with mediation and loved it and thought when I got enough gray hair and experience behind me, I would like to become a mediator, and I did. Well, it's fantastic. I mean, I think a lot of our listeners won't know what a mediator is, so how does a lawyer become a mediator? Great question. In Mississippi, it's, it's very easy. Uh, you can be a mediator without any specific qualifications, but to be listed as a mediator with the Mississippi Bar Directory of mediation, Mediators, you must take a an initial class that is usually covered over two or three days that trains you on mediation techniques, and then every two years you do a refresher course that's typically a day long. Well, and among your, media, your many accomplishments, and they are many in, in terms of trial law, and uh, also you're, you're a member of a BODO, which is one of the uh, highest levels of trial uh, admission. Well, for, for trial lawyers, that is a, a great accomplishment. Thank um, you. In addition to that, you know, you are a member of the uh, Mississippi Bar Directory of uh, Mediators. And so, you know, um, how, as a mediator, we think about lawyers and we think about, you know, I've got a lawyer, you've got a lawyer, we, we uh, are, are, are litigate against each other. Um, and, you know, we have a case against each other. Does a mediator represent uh, both parties or, or neither? Or how does that work? Great question. A mediator is completely neutral. And that's one of the first things that I talk to participants in mediations about is it may look sometimes like we have a bias or a preference. That is absolutely not the case. Where you spend the most time is typically where you have the most work to do. But we, we have no... Um, um, advocacy for either side. We're completely neutral, much like a judge would be. And uh, I know you mentioned you were, uh, you're also a member of the Florida Bar. I know that uh, mediation in Florida is something that they really encourage in a lot of cases um, and uh, even require in some. So what, why might uh, parties choose mediation instead of litigation? There are a lot of reasons. I can't necessarily rank them, but among the top reasons are the cost. You are going to save significant amounts of money if you mediate a dispute rather than litigate it. Another factor that I rank towards the top is the element of control. When you mediate a case, you reach an agreement or a settlement that you can live with. It's acceptable to you or you don't reach it. Where when you litigate, it's a little bit like the Wild West. You don't know what the outcome's going to be. And so those are my, my top two reasons. There are other reasons as well, but I don't want to devote too much time to any particular subject, but, but those are big factors that favor mediation over litigation. This morning, we are talking about mediation. You can send us your email questions to our address, legalterms at mpbonline.org. 
Our guest is Susan Steffi from Watson Eager. Watkins and Eager. Watkins and Eager. Right. And I have a question. Sure. What's the difference between mediation and arbitration? Great question. In the mediation, I try to facilitate settlement between the parties. It's a little bit like shuttle diplomacy, going back and forth between rooms and parties and lawyers if they're represented, and helping them arrive at a resolution that they can live with. In an arbitration, I would act essentially as the judge. I make a ruling, and you might like that ruling or you might not like it, but it's my decision, not, not the parties. That's, that's such a great—thank uh, you for, do, for uh, explaining that, because I think um, you know, a lot of us, when we uh, get credit cards or uh, sign on to uh, download something from the Internet, we agree to arbitration. Um, and that's one form of dispute resolution. But you know, today we're talking about uh, mediation. And how is how do you think mediation has helped the practice of law? It's something that when when I first started out, there was not a lot of mediation. It was you know you either settle or you go to trial. But there was not this these some of these alternative means to dispute res, re, resolve disputes. Do you think it's made a big difference? I really do. It has exploded in popularity over the years. We have much more voluntary mediation. That's where the parties just elect to have a mediation and they select a mediator. We also have much more court-ordered mediation today because our judges, both at the state and federal level, have seen that it is a very effective tool for resolving litigation early and often. Right. And so can you tell us a little bit, can you walk us through a little bit about your approach? Let's, you know, so you've got a, a, a lot of your mediation probably deals with domestic relations, I would imagine. I mean, it can be in, in many different settings, but you've got two people who are very angry with each other and uh, and they know they want to get a divorce. But so what what is the process of mediation like? I mean, when you work with the parties? Sure. Um, what I try to do is make sure before we even meet for the mediation, that some of the groundwork for a successful mediation has already occurred. For example, if they need to share financial information or certain records, or if uh, we haven't yet resolved who's going to make the first offer and who's going to work on the settlement documents. I try to do all that before the mediation ever starts so that we're not wasting a lot of time on the morning of a mediation with what I would call almost logistics or, or, or very procedural type stuff. Um, I typically dispense with opening statement in a mediation. That's where both parties are in the same room and they each give you their spiel. I find that sometimes the harm that occurs in that process uh, takes some while, a while to undo. And so I typically have our parties start separately. I meet with each of them separately, and I encourage them. Uh, well, first of all, I applaud them for being in a mediation, and then I encourage them to let the process play out, to be patient, and to realize that all successful mediations require compromise. And I, particularly, you mentioned the family law setting. I do a lot of mediations in the family law setting, partly because I have a long history in that area of practice, but also there are so many really good mediators in the state that shy away from anything family-related because they don't have familiarity, and it's highly emotional. I love where the rubber meets the road, and so I actually enjoy doing them. Um, but I will talk to people about family and about post-divorce life and why, especially if you have children, why mediation can do things for you that are just infinitely better for your family and your post-divorce life than if you go through a contested trial. And we have a call on the line. Let's go to Florence and talk with our friend Roger. Roger, we're glad you've called in today on mediation. What's your comment or question for our guest attorney, Susan Steffi? Well, I've known Susan a long time, and she's great, and uh, she knows that I'm a long-time uh, mediator, but just a teeny bit of history, I think, is good for your listeners. Thirty years ago, this was not popular among attorneys 
in Mississippi. Now, we were already 20 years behind other states, but that says something about our, our profession that we ought to now be proud of and maybe maybe not so proud of 30 years ago. The, uh, it took a long time for attorneys to realize these advantages that Susan has mentioned. And the purpose of my call, well, the, 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 an example of that was when I was on the bench uh, as a chancery judge, I set up a mediation program. There was one other one in the state uh, over in uh, Lauderdale, I mean, uh, over in Meridian, that district. Uh, and attorneys didn't like it, but we had experts like, I don't know that you were doing that at that point, Susan, but we had people that were that were doing mediation, but the lawyers fought it. Okay, now they're in favor of it. Why? A lot of, one of the reasons that you haven't mentioned, Susan, I guess, unless I missed it, is the delay associated with litigation. Court, the courts are loaded. The courts are busy. They're busy with very important things and some things that are not so important. And they use up our, court, our, our, uh, our judges and our courts with processes that take a long time. And then you've got an appellate process. So I'm, I'm currently doing really only now uh, EEOC complaint mediations. But when you have an, an EEOC complaint and you can't settle it, uh, you may go before an administrative judge a year and a half later, and you may get a decision another year later. You're going to be literally one or two or more years getting a decision. Well, you don't want to wait. So mediation, one of the advantages is you can get a mediator to hear your case. And if your attorneys are hesitant, you may need a different attorney uh, because you should try it. It's not binding. It's not like arbitration. Don't get me started on arbitration. <laughs> Judge, you are so right. Uh, for the listeners, this is Judge Roger Clapp. From, he was a chancellor in Rankin County, Mississippi, and as he mentioned, was absolutely on the cutting edge of bringing mediation to Mississippi. And we all owe him a huge thanks for helping get us where we are today, and and I cannot agree more that there are so many advantages to mediation, including how much quicker a case can be resolved. We like quick, quicker. Thank you so much, Roger, for adding that to our show. You can send us your questions by email, legalterms at mpbonline.org. We're discussing mediation with attorney Susan Steffi. If you have a computer, how can you listen to In Legal Terms? I'll tell you next. You are listening to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. I'm Walt Grayson. You can now listen to the wild, weird, and wonderful stories of Mississippi with Mile Marker. Some of the big names that travel up and down the highways, obviously Elvis and Johnny Cash, and you have Jerry Lewis, Hall Perkins. Join me as we hit the roads of Mississippi on Mile Marker. Johnny Cash suggested that Carl write a song called Blue Suede Shoes that was all kind of created with Aaron Amory. You can listen by going to mpbonline.org slash radio or by using your favorite podcasting app. When you look at your vehicle, think of MPB. Need to get rid of your ride? Donate it by calling 877-MPB-4-CAR. Need to have some work done on your truck? Listen to AutoCorrect Thursdays at 10, Saturdays at 11. An MPB license plate reminds you that MPB is with you wherever you go. Go to your county office and ask for an MPB car tag. MPB and cars, better together. 
this is in legal terms. Not everybody has a chance to listen to our show live, so if you've missed any of our program, you can listen to the whole show from our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. Our host is Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law. I'm Liz Gill. You can hear most of MPB's uh, morning local shows by selecting from just one website mpbonline.org slash radio and also from that site you can listen live to mpb think radio but also mpb music radio this morning we are talking about mediation with attorney susan steffi richard we are so glad to have uh, susan with us today and uh, learning about the the what kind of disputes can mediation resolve um, mediation is really ideal for all disputes, in my opinion. Um, you can use it for car wrecks. You can use it for premises liability, pharmaceutical litigation, all matters of family law, including estate disputes, construction litigation. I truly know of no form of dispute that mediation is not good for. In fact, I'll give you a cute example a few years ago that didn't even involve a lawsuit. An uh, esteemed member of the bar called me and was having difficulty with his two older teenage daughters, and they had a lot of conflict. And he said, if you guys don't get to a better place, I'm going to have Miss Steffi mediate this dispute for you. And I loved it and told him I would be honored to do it. They wound up working it out because because for reasons I cannot explain, they were somewhat intimidated by that process. But uh, I loved the idea that, you know, we only think of mediation as a tool for resolving litigation. But honestly, mediation is excellent for l resolving conflict. It's a, it is such a great tool. And by the way, you mentioned construction litigation. I think by doing mediation and construction litigation, you're saving juries from having to uh, <laughs> try to stay awake during some of, the, some of those cases. Exactly. Um, important cases nonetheless, but, uh, but no, and so, you know, you, you know, but you come at this uh, from being a litigator, and I think that that's important, too, because you've seen that side of it. And could you talk a little bit, ABOTA, you're a member of the ABOTA, uh, which is an invitation-only uh, organization for the, the top litigators. Um, so have talk, mention just exactly what a boda is if you don't mind because i think that will give listeners some context about then how you get how you move into mediation sure a, a boda is as you note a very distinguished organization that's invitation only for members of the bar that are known to have high integrity ethics collegiality but be very effective litigators and you have to have a minimum number of trials under your belt. Uh, you can be a fantastic lawyer, fantastic litigator, but if you've only tried a handful of cases, you cannot qualify for a BOTA because a BOTA wants all those good traits, but they also want you to truly have been tested and tried a lot of lawsuits before you become a member of it. Uh, I was very honored to be invited. But remember, the role of a litigator is completely different than the role of a mediator. In litigation, I am all about the win. That is what my eyes are on, the prize of the win. And everything is going to be colored through the prism of advocacy. In a mediator, I'm all about reaching resolution and an agreement. And so I have to take off that litigator hat and put on the mediator hat of how can I best achieve a workable solution for these people and are these parties sometimes it's a business versus a business and so it's a very different concept i think my litigation history helps me be a better mediator because i'm familiar with discovery and depositions and hearings and judges and juries and the expense the time the lack of control that i mentioned before 
And, and so I think those experiences I bring to the table in trying to persuade parties to reach an agreement and truthfully what's a workable agreement once in a while i make suggestions to the parties and their lawyers about how to resolve a case that isn't even something they'd ever thought of not because i'm so bright or so creative but because i've been there and i've done that and i knew that something worked or didn't work so can you ask the parties for additional information as the mediator? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I can talk to the parties confidentially. Liz, if you came to me for a dispute and you were mediating it and you wanted me to know some things that I could not share with the other side, all you have to do is say, Susan, I'm telling you, but you are not allowed to tell the other side. And I am ethically bound to keep that um, confidence. And I do, of course. Um, I, I do ask people for other information. I try to read whatever is given to me in advance of the mediation. And sometimes that does prompt questions that I'll go ahead and ask in advance of the mediation. Because one of my goals is, first and foremost, to reach a settlement. And secondly, to do it as efficiently as possible. I love learning the theory about mediation, but l let's let's get down to it. So if someone sues me or I'm thinking about suing someone or there is a dispute, how do you initiate mediation? Great question. More often than not, I'm called by one or both of the attorneys, or I'm emailed by one or both of the attorneys for the parties. I have had a few situations where parties that were not represented by lawyers asked me if I would just help them resolve a dispute, and similarly, they reached out by telephone or email. I always am going to run conflict checks, because even though I don't represent either party, I always say my bias is towards settlement, not towards people, um, but I do run that because I work in a large firm, and I want to be sure that I disclose to both sides any prior relationships that either I or any member of my firm might have had with one of the parties. That, that's a, such an interesting point, Susan, because of uh, the, the conflicts of interest rules. And as a mediator, you really don't represent either party, but, but I think it's important that the parties understand that you come to this completely in a neutral setting. Um, now, how would uh, you are with a big firm? You mentioned Watkins and Eager uh, in downtown Jackson, and, and uh, how would somebody get in, in touch with your firm or, or you or, or a mediator if they needed one? Okay. Typically, if the parties are represented by lawyers, the lawyer will call or email me directly, and then I'll do the conflict check. Um, you can call just the general number, and they'll get you to me or some of my colleagues who also mediate. Um, it, again, if a party is representing themselves, they can reach out directly to me. I've had a few people that the lawyers have told me that their client actually asked for me to mediate the case, which was very flattering because obviously I'm I'm pretty well known within the bar. But when folks on the street say, I've heard good things about Susan Steffi, would you see if she would mediate the case? That, that really felt great. And so that's happened on occasion, I guess, just from word of mouth or something. But it's an easy process. That is great. And, you know, so Judge Clapp called, and, and uh, always glad to have Roger call and, and uh, the great listener on the show, on the, on the, for the show. But if, uh, if mediation doesn't resolve a re dispute, um, he said arbitration would be binding. But so what, let's say you, you, you try to mediate a case and it doesn't work out. Love that question, because that does happen on occasion. We're not able to reach a resolution at the mediation you're in complete control as the participant, and if if the the best deal on the table is not something you're willing to do, you get to say no, and you get to go home. I um, am naturally competitive, and I want my cases to settle. I feel like a failure when I do not settle cases for the parties. And so I will follow up with them afterwards, and because I've found that many mediations that don't settle on the day of mediation 
will settle. They just need a little time, a little space, you know, opportunity to reflect, or perhaps they, I, I can think of a specific case that didn't mediate where it was clear to me we needed a couple of appraisals done. And I asked the parties to please get some appraisals done, and I thought we could, we could then put it to bed, and we did. So... If you don't reach an agreement in mediation, you're free to go, but I encourage you to keep the dialogue going because you're probably going to reach a settlement soon thereafter if that's what you want. So could mediation just take one afternoon? Typically, it takes a day. A full day. In the divorce cases, that day can be long. It can go well into the evening. I always tell people to bring things to read, and we make sure we feed them well, because I don't want any hangry people in a mediation. Um, some mediations are so narrow that you can get them done in half a day. There's just one issue, sort of like a car wreck, who pays and how much. That, that typically can be done in half a day. We're talking about mediation today. Email us those questions. Our address is legalterms at mpbonline.org. We're talking with attorney Susan Steffi about mediation. We're telling you lots of different ways you can listen to MPB Think Radio. I'll tell you some more ways that you can listen to our podcast next. You are listening to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. Join us each week for Everyday Tech on MPB Think Radio. We have an IT expert, a computer repair ace, and we troubleshoot your problems on the phones as well. Everyday Tech, Wednesdays at 10 on MPB Think Radio. Download the podcast now or listen on YouTube on the MPB Think Radio channel. You're listening to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. Professor Richard Gershon is our expert host. I'm Liz Gill. We do hope that you'll subscribe to our podcast. You can listen from the iHeart Radio app, your Amazon or Google smart speaker, Spotify, and my personal favorite, Deezer. We had a list of 10 ways you could listen and uh uh, I, I still get I get uh, Z, Deezer pop up ads on my Facebook. Maybe because I say Deezer. What's a Deezer? Yeah, what's a Deezer? <laughs> this morning we're talking about mediation with our guest, a Susan Attorney Susan Steffi. Um, Liz, this is a great discussion. We're great to have great to have Susan on this morning, and uh, you know we're talking about a really an important topic because I think a lot of people don't aren't aware of mediation unless they've been through it. Uh, and they're concerned about, you know, uh, resolving a dispute. And certainly this is a great way to do that. Um, and, and Susan, some states, I, you mentioned Florida. I mean, I know that Florida requires uh, mediation in some situations involving dissolution of marriage. Um, and does Mississippi require mediation at any point? I am not aware of any court in Mississippi that uniformly requires mediation, but many of our judges do require mediation. It's just, on, as opposed to Florida, where it's a, a blanket requirement, it's more ad hoc or individual in Mississippi. But again, many of our judges, both state and federal, do require mediation. And in our chancery court, which is a component of state court, 
many of our chancellors require mediation in advance of a trial. As you know, Richard, but I'm not sure all our audience knows this, chancery court is where family matters tend to be. Divorces, custody disputes, as well as estate issues. It, it covers many more things than that, but that is the court that always covers those kinds of disputes, and they're big fans of court order mediation. But again, many of our federal and state court judges are as well. I think of it a little bit like rehab. In the old days, you used to be told if someone needed rehabilitation and you made them go, it wouldn't be successful. They had to voluntarily admit that they needed help. That turned out not to statistically be true. Whether people went voluntarily or involuntarily, the success rates were pretty comparable. I think the same thing is true of mediation. If you make someone go, I'm still going to give it my all to get the case resolved, as are any of the mediators that I'm familiar with. And we're usually going to get the case settled, even if someone came kicking and screaming. Well, and this is interesting to me because we've had a show talking about... <coughs> Mississippi not having a no-fault divorce, and if that theoretically is to keep a family together, you would think mediation should be required. That's it. That's an excellent point. I certainly would be in favor of uniformly requiring mediation in d divorce cases, particularly in divorce cases involving children, because the less conflict, the better for their children. And having a third-party neutral a mediator helping people craft situations that can work well for children, especially especially for children, is just invaluable. And to your point, Liz, is very pro-family. Now, don't get me started on that we don't have no-fault divorce. We'd have to have a whole other show on that because uh, I feel very passionately that we need to, at a minimum, adopt a 13th ground that lets people get divorced because they've grown apart in ways that they can't reconcile or repair. Um, Florida, the state I practiced in before I moved here, was what's called purely no fault. There were no grounds except an irretrievable break in the marriage. And I promise you, Florida's divorce rate is no higher than Mississippi's divorce rate, you know, year in and year out. Uh, but again, that would take a whole nother show. And Susan, we actually had Judge Odom on to talk about um, the commission that he was on uh, uh, with uh, Professor Bell. Um, and they got, they made some good recommendations in that respect, but what I understand is those did not go forward, unfortunately. They did. They did terrific work. Uh, I was not on that commission, but I kept up with the work they were doing and was so disappointed that the legislature uh, was not willing to go ahead and move forward because the commission was full of just elite members of the bar and the bench, including, as you mentioned, Professor Bell and Judge Odom. But, but one day, you know, we're not defeated. We're just delayed. And so, you know, now you, you, know, you have um, all these—we do have fault-based grounds, and so you've got a couple— they're, they, the, the marriage is broken. Whether you know whether they want to, they need to create fault race from grounds or not. Um, how do you how do you approach this? You've got you've got people. Then you, I mean, you, you, you mentioned you may start them off in the same room, but then they go to different rooms, and you spend time with each of them separately. I do. In fact, in divorce cases. My presumption is that we start separate and we stay separate. I just have found that there, there, there's too much risk involved in having some joint sessions where people start advocating or speaking very freely. So if the grounds for divorce itself are an issue in a divorce case, that obviously is the first impediment that we must overcome. You can't reach an agreement if you can't even agree agree that that the marriage is over and that's 
It's such a difficult thing. I, I, you know, you must spend, do you find you spend time, more time with maybe one party than the other in some cases? Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons why I always mention at the beginning of a mediation, please do not interpret the time I spend in one room versus another is that I prefer being in that room or am more comfortable talking to those people because that's not the case. That's where I have the most work to do. I'm having to convince someone that we need to make another step and this is the step I recommend or convince someone that trying to divide a child like a math equation is not in a child's best interest and you know things like that it, it doesn't mean they're the difficult party it just means that's where I have the work to do in the moment and so it typically fluctuates over the course of a day. I might be in one room for 10 minutes and then the next room for 45. And then when we're on the next turn, it's the exact opposite. We've got attorney Susan Steffi from Watkins and Eager. We are talking about mediation today. We're going to go to Greene County and speak with Lane. Now, I don't know if Lane is actually from Greene County or not, or if Lane is their name. But we don't necessarily need uh, the right name or the right county. Uh, anyone can call in and and say whoever they are. But it, Lane, we are glad that you called in today. What's your comment or question for the show? So yes, my name is Lane, and I am in Greene County, Mississippi. I heard you. I came kind of late to the show, but I had a question about arbitration. And uh, do you, are y'all handling that today? Uh, arbitration with a car dealer that I have to deal with today. Um, sure. Our, we do okay. arbitrate cases, including disputes with car dealerships. Um, that's not something I do a lot of, but there are most of those agreements, as you know, do require arbitration. And so those disputes are arb arbitrated often. I just don't personally do a lot of car dispute arbitrations. Okay, so uh, this case is uh, so, so we were driving through Alabama, lost the transmission, and had to put in a new one at, in Montgomery, one of the dealers there, and um, then came back. We were in Mississippi and Hattiesburg, had to take it to another dealer because the transmission dropped. They found out that it was a bunch of parts were missing, and now I've got to uh, try to get uh, some rental uh, car um, uh, reimbursement. So. Can you tell me if I need what I need to do? Do I need to go to a uh, get a lawyer for that, or do I need to? Uh, uh, the, the, they may I uh, saw something about arbitration on their, their uh, work order or something, but I'm not sure if that was the nine. So what what can you tell me? What you right, if you again professing and admitting this is not my wheelhouse, but the first thing I would do is read your contract and what it says on the back of the contract or wherever it might be about arbitration. And with the background of that knowledge, I would reach out to the party I had a dispute with because sometimes, believe it or not, people are willing to resolve a dispute without going through the expense and time of arbitration, depending on what is involved. Sometimes they're going to rest on their entitlement to an arbitration, and that contract you signed will reference the, the applicable arbitration rules, and you can get those, and you can institute the process for entering into an arbitration. And as far as whether you want a lawyer or not for that, I'm always going to recommend that someone have a lawyer because I'm a lawyer. <laughs> and, and I just realized that there are a lot of traps for the unwary when you represent yourself. But there's not a requirement that you have an attorney. I just think it's a good idea. But again, before I jumped to the formal arbitration proceedings, I would give the company an opportunity or the dealership an opportunity to make right. Okay, so the uh, so let me ask you this, and so I'm a resident of Mississippi, but the service was done in Alabama. So, who do I need to go to for uh, legal representation? More likely than not, Alabama, but. Okay. 
but I can't say that definitively without looking at your contract. But who I'd reach out first to is the dealership in Alabama. Mm -hmm. Let them know the problem you're having. See what their proposed solution is. Because, again, if you can work it out, it's always better to work it out. Arbitration is a more expensive process than mediation because it is a more formal process. And sometimes even your contracts require that a certain arbitration service be used. So, again, try it, try it the nice way first, read your contract, and then probably consult with a lawyer. Thank you, Lane. We appreciate you calling in. We would love to take your questions on our email address, legalterms at mpbonline.org. Attorney Susan Steffi from Watkins and Eager is our guest. And what is my favorite way to listen to past MPB shows? I'm going to tell you next. This is In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit and Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app. Thank you for being part of In Legal Terms. If you've missed any of our program, you can listen to the whole show on the MPB Think Radio YouTube channel. But it's also available on my very favorite way to listen to our past shows, the MPB Public Media app. Our host is Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law. I'm Liz Gill. At 11 a.m. Central, on Tuesdays following our over-the-air broadcast, you can hear Southern Remedies, Relatively Speaking, with Dr. Susan Buttress on MPB Think Radio. We have got attorney Susan Seth Steffi from Watkins and & Eager, and we're talking about mediation today. And, and Susan, I get kind of along the spectrum of mediation. I remember uh, 20 years ago or so, almost 20 years ago, I was living in Charleston, South Carolina, and some lawyers approached me about doing a, a CLE program on collaborative law, and it was the first time I had really heard of that concept. And what exactly is collaborative law, and how is that related to mediation? I love that question. I'm right now serving on a bar, a Mississippi Bar Committee to make recommendations about collaborative law in Mississippi, and um, it's a wonderful uh, committee that includes, among others, your professor, Debbie Bell. Collaborative law has been around for a long time now, but it has not taken off here in Mississippi. It, it has taken off in many jurisdictions. It is where the parties approach, for example, a divorce. It does not have to be limited to family law matters. It could be outside of that, but divorce is a really excellent arena for it. The parties approach it from the standpoint of we're not going to be adversarial. We're going to reach an agreement, and we need to just do work together to get to a fair, equitable, just agreement that everybody can live with. And so the, the lawyers that enter into a collaborative agreement with the parties, the parties they represent, are coming at it from a different angle from the very outset. 
we're trying to reach an agreement that's going to work for everyone. And we're going to voluntarily share information that's necessary to form this agreement. And again, I'm going to stick with the divorce context, but it can be in others. So we would voluntarily share financial information. We would voluntarily information share information concerning the children's medical condition and schooling and anything that might be relevant to coming up with the best agreement between the parties. We're not going to make you go through issuing a bunch of subpoenas and requests for production of documents and interrogatories. And again, for our lay audience, that's those are all words for formal inquiry, if you will, into each side about basic information you need. We're going to just voluntarily provide that with the goal of getting to an agreement. And to make it work, there's some teeth in the collaborative law process in that if it fails and either party decides we're going to litigate instead of agree, we're going to become adversarial, you have to discharge your current lawyers and start anew with new lawyers. Um, those of us on the committee had some concerns whether we could get it off the ground in Mississippi because of that provision. Many lawyers out there don't like the idea of if it fails, I'm fired or I have to withdraw. But we learned in our studies and conversations with counsel around the country that do this that that is fundamentally essential to make the process work. It keeps you from having people enter into this collaborative process lightly or just to test the waters. There has to be some real consequence if you're not all in and really there in good faith. And, and so that's why that's a very important component of the collaborative law process. But I think it dovetails beautifully with mediation because it's about an alternative form of dispute resolution, ending the case sooner, cheaper, and, and on terms that you can live with. The cynic in me says the good, the good thing about uh, making it binding that the lawyers have to be discharged, as besides the ethical issues that now you've shared confidences and you know, there could be conflict of interest issues, et cetera, but I mean, that they have to be discharged because then there's no interest in that lawyer in the greater fees that might be generated by going to trial. Absolutely right. <laughs> and, and I think that was, you know, I think that's also a good selling point to the parties. You mentioned that with mediation as the cost, the time, uh, that mediation is so much of a, a, it can be so much of a less expensive process, right. a less timely process. Um, so what are there times when, and I know we don't have much time, Rose, I, we, it, as always, the time goes too fast, and Susan's such a great guest. I'm sorry, it's going so fast. But um, are there circumstances where uh, mediation is just not ideal and you wouldn't even recommend it? No. Um, I know that you might think that in cases of domestic abuse or where a party's dissipated marital assets or, or where the grounds itself for divorce or contested would not be ideal, but I actually think it is. It's still very ripe for mediation because the mediator can take that history into consideration and work with the lawyers knowing that backdrop. I do not think those cases are good for collaborative law. If, we, if you were to have collaborative law in Mississippi, which I believe we will soon, I would exempt those cases from collaborative law just because the, I would think the probability of failure would be fairly high and the probability of some overreaching. But as you can probably tell in the mediator role, I'm a fairly forceful personality and no one's going to be strong armed. Uh, we're going to work together. Is the mediator always one person? Could you have a mediator team? Like if you were in a divorce and a woman wanted a woman med mediator and a man wanted a man mediator? What a great question. It does happen. We do have cases where we have multiple mediators. They typically are multiple party cases, but you can absolutely have more than one mediator. And in arbitration, which we just briefly touched on, 
oftentimes it is a panel of arbitrators of three people. Uh, that's a very expensive process, um, so you've got to enter into that one thinking about the cost of paying three arbitrators, but you sure can. You can have more than one mediator. Oh, Professor Gerson, this is just excellent. I'm so glad. Thank you, uh, Attorney Susan Steffi from Watson and Eager for being on our show. This has been a great show today. Great. Thank you. I really had fun, and it was so nice to meet uh, in person all these names I've known for years. Well, we'll give you a tour in just a bit. That's going to wrap up for today's In Legal Terms. Thank you, Java Chapman, and thank you, Jay White, for helping us with our show, and for Professor Richard Gerson, who hosts from the University of Mississippi. School of Law. I'm Liz Gill. We hope you join us next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Central for In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio.